Hey everyone, welcome to uh, another episode of Gaming Conversations. Uh, this week I have guest Sonny K. Um, Sonny's been known for doing such projects as Angel Hair, VSS, A Peen of the Past, Year of Future, as well as running a uh, record label uh, GSL, as well as a record distribution called Bottleneck. Uh, he's done graphic art design and collage since then, and uh, currently has a book out. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Headspaces, Surrealistic Album Art and Collage by Sonny K. That's right. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for participating, man. My pleasure entirely, Travis. Thanks for having me. So, okay, I didn't find this out until recently, like last six months or so through Jorge, that um, you live in Hot Springs. So what, I do, yeah. How'd that come about, and when did you transition there? Um, it, I've been here for about two and a half years, and um, it came about entirely out of the blue. A uh, mutual friend of uh, Jorge's and mine, a guy named Bobby Missile, okay. who uh, I have known um, for about 15 years uh, from passing through Hot Springs on tour with Your Future back then. Uh, he had a band back then called Attractive and Popular, who wound up um, being one of the last bands on GSL. Okay, okay. That makes perfect and uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I, we, we stayed in touch and um, I was a little familiar with hot springs from from having passed through that one time um and uh over the years i would put on shows for subsequent bands that bobby was in and um you know we just kept it going and then eventually out of the blue one day i got a call from him and um this organization that he works for low-key arts which i was familiar with through him uh needed a director and um the rest is history <laughs> okay all right um, awesome so um Going back further, if I remember correctly, you were you were born in England and you moved yes. around a lot before yeah. coming to the U.S. So, like, That's right. I guess go into the different places you lived at and earliest memories of before okay. coming to the U.S. <laughs> well, um, my dad was an American film director mm -hmm. who um, <clears throat> had uh, lived abroad for uh, close to two decades in Europe and uh, eventually found himself in England uh, where he met my mom. Okay, and. Um, they had a very quick sort of whirlwind romance and um, <laughs> were, <laughs> he was, sorry, what? So never heard of those. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Um, my dad was considerably older than my mom and uh, his career uh, had sort of plateaued as, as, as a, as a, um, well, I, I don't know. He, he, you know, he had had many highs and lows, let's put it that way. And um, by the time he got married and had a family, he was, was sort of like on the back end of all that. Okay. Um, so we sort of wound up on a, a, a little bit of what in hindsight feels kind of like a wild goose chase around the world um, for a few years, sort of because of all that. And um, <clears throat> we moved from England, as soon as I was born, we moved to Johannesburg, South Africa. Okay. Where we were, where we lived for a year. My dad was involved with a, studio there and um launching a, a production company that actually never really got off the ground and he wound up getting a lot of trouble with the um south african authorities oh shit um, <laughs> because <laughs> he because, not for anything that he really did he angered his employers by not um okay just the business relations really deteriorated quickly my, my parents were kind of stuck there for a while and eventually um got out in my dad's case kind of by the skin of his teeth actually um, which was pretty wild. Um, of course, I, I was totally unaware of that. Um, we, we then moved to Barcelona in Spain, where we lived for two years. And I, and I think probably my earliest memories come from that, although they're very, very uh, abstract and just kind of, you know, flashes of images of, uh, yeah. you know, somebody's garden or something You're like, like that. Three or something, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. About okay. Three, four, sense. five. Yeah. Uh, my first sister was born while we lived there. And then we moved um, back to England for about four years mm -hmm. until the very end of the 70s. In December 1979, we moved to Los Angeles. And uh, by that time, I had two sisters. Another sister was born in England. And um, so my dad uh, was kind of rescued by his friends in California who, who sort of uh, <clears throat> came in at the 11th hour and uh, sort of resurrected directed his career a little bit in, in, in LA, okay. uh, which was uh, kind of short-lived and, and not particularly, um, uh, you know, 
illustrious or, or, or fruitful for that matter. It was kind of sure. pretty weird. And, okay. you know, he'd been away a long time and came back and the whole industry had changed and he was much older and yeah. you know, California had changed, you know, mm-hmm. like it was a real culture shock on a lot of levels. So, and that's, I was seven at that time. And then, okay. you know, I started from that point on, I feel like I started becoming <clears throat> more cognizant of what was going on around me. And, and, and I remember things more clearly now. Yeah, I imagine it was probably pretty vivid. A lot of a lot of memories or what was going on at the time, you know, like absolutely, yeah. Um, and so much of it sort of has colored who I am as an adult, which I never really would have, you know, understood back then. But um, just sort of um, the idea of kind of transience for one thing, travel, constant constant travel, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, upheaval, not necessarily like in a in a bad way at all, but just that. Um, kind of in a, 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 a weird convoluted kind of way, a sense of like progress being tied to moving on or traveling or, sure. you know, that sure. kind of thing. And yeah. I think yeah. um, probably subconsciously as a child, like um, absorbing some of the excitement of, of going to these new places or, or mm-hmm. being part of these new ventures that, that seem to be happening left and right for a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway, that was yeah. that. Yeah. I, I did some brief moving around when I was younger, but it was all in the same city. So, I mean, it was, there was always something. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Sioux City, Iowa, you know, like okay. 90,000 right. people. Like Russell, our mutual friend, Russell White, right. where sure. he was from. But um, right. yeah, we, it, was, it was strange. It was just like an industrial town and everything. But mm-hmm. um, with each move, you definitely are recognizing something different or something new or sure. your outlook's changing. So I can only imagine, you know, like, so, I mean, you, so you weren't in LA for the, for our, you know, the entire time. So when was it that we eventually, you relocated to Colorado, right? Cause you're right. so, out of Boulder. Yes. And that um, was the final step in my, in, in our family sort of, um, being on this weird trajectory that was being defined by my dad's uh, career, I guess you could say. Um, So we, yeah, we lived, we were in, we were in LA for about um, eight years, seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my mom definitely sort of took over as the breadwinner for the family and um, wound up um, working in a lot of, um, film studios and stuff herself. She was a TV producer before my parents got married. Oh, shit. Um, so, but she's very, um, she's very resourceful and very, um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? She, she's, she's able to adapt and um, having three mm-hmm. kids really um, forced her out of her comfort zone, I think on, on many occasions. Yeah. And um, so she really was the, uh, she was my role model growing up. I have no um, shame in saying that whatsoever. She's no. an incredible human being and still is. And um, I loved my dad, but he was really um, not very present. His mind <clears throat> um, was elsewhere. I don't really know where, but um, sure, he just was like not in a good place for most of what I remember of, of him. He eventually um, passed when I was, when I was uh, 19. When we were, oh, so anyway, let me get, yeah, let me back up. Yeah, uh, we moved to Boulder because um, uh, a, a good friend and fam and his family of my dad ha- was from there, and we wound up um, going there because this this man was sort of semi retired as well, and the two of them hatched this scheme to start a production company in Boulder. Okay, which uh, now would probably be a great idea, but back then uh wasn't such a great idea especially with two guys closing in on 70 um trying trying to do that it was just uh oh yeah not yeah. realistic at all mm-hmm. um and so it didn't really go anywhere but uh, moving to boulder having said that was like probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me i, I feel like and definitely changed the course of everything for me sure and um was really great for our family too. I think all of us, um, with the exception of my dad, all of the rest of us um, really, uh, I don't know, kind of blossomed being there mm-hmm. in a sense. It was uh, where, you know, it, it was, uh, 
I don't know, it was sort of the first, I think, without getting philosophical, I think it was the first time as a family that we were all kind of like, you know, really content or happy. I think my mom was at ease. She had a new relationship and things like that. So it was just a different time for everyone. So that's where you kind of like got more your grounding as a family, perhaps, or like functional family or... Yeah, I mean, we were, my mom and my sisters and I were always close, even with our dad. It was, there was never any um, real rift there, but our dad was just kind of like, it was sort of like living with a person who's fading away while, while they're there in a the room with you. Okay. If that makes okay. sense. No, you for know, sure. For sure. Present, but, not, but really not. And um, just kind of deteriorating yeah. invisibly. And yeah. not so invisibly too, you know. Sure. Um, but yeah, so Colorado was great for us. And for me, I was, you know, I, I, um, I, I hated high school, but I, but I also was able to, to use that experience of moving to a different place in the middle of high school to kind of reinvent who I was and um, mm -hmm. uh, to sort of in, uh, investigate and embrace things that always... Um, held a kind of mystery appeal to me in, in California, but um, I was intimidated by, by older people or more experienced people. And Yeah, um, I feel you there. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, yep, definitely. Mm -hmm. So feeling like an, a true outsider, I mean, I've always been a little bit of an outsider, you know what I mean? Like I've always, just just the nature of all kind of, you know, showing up a couple of grades after everybody else all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that experience moving to, to the, I mean, it was just such a culture shock going from Cal, from North Hollywood, California to Lafayette, Colorado. I mean, uh, where is Lafayette, Colorado? I'm not even familiar. It's right outside. It's much more uh, suburban now than it was then. It's, it's right outside of Boulder um, and it's directly north of Denver. Okay. So, okay. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. Not directly north. It's on, yeah, it's between Boulder and Denver, sort of. Okay. Not really too far from either one. Um, but back then it was just sort of like the last place before you got onto the open plain, you know what I mean? On your way to Kansas. So it was like, yeah. there was no, there was no glamor living there, especially not having to leave, um, you know, what was a pretty idyllic kind of like TV show situation in California, you know, sure. I like I went to school at like, you know, 90210 land <laughs> uh, coming from iowa in the eight like i was born in 77 so you have four years on me but i still remember like you're saying like with three years at three years old you know you kind of got those images and things and then like the early 80s of course going into the 80s like only thing i thought about was either like california or new york you know like hollywood movies everything that it resembles or new york where it's just something that is completely 180 and sure you know um, yeah Coming yeah. from this like area that just felt like a wasteland, you know, I was always like my, the grass is greener on the other side. I have to move to California when I'm older. <laughs> oh, yeah. So. And I remember that sentiment being echoed all around me in, in, in Colorado. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially being so close, you know, like it's right yeah. over there. Like I could move to California. Yeah. 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 There's cool. almost like a direct uh, thoroughfare actually from Boulder and Denver to to the Bay Area um, on on Interstate 80 it literally feels like I mean it's still 1200 miles or something but it kind of feels like a, a straight shot you know what I mean in fact totally. I think there was a band in Colorado called 80 West or something if I remember there was a band from somewhere around oh, there back Interstate in the 80 is that what it yeah, is yeah it was okay. it's all about the interstate you know um, so <laughs> you know people forget that you have to pass through Utah, Nevada, and Wyoming to get there. So. <laughs> yeah, those are less important. We don't have to worry about that. We'll deal with them when we get there. Right. So was it like through high school and then um, gradually getting to know people who was like a few years older than you that you started to get into, uh, I, I guess I should ask, like how, how was it that you started to get into any kinds of music? Like did you grow up in a family that played a lot of music, you know, or uh, uh, did you eventually meet kids who were the influences? Actually, um, yeah, I, I uh, music, the, the love of music, I think, came from outside of my family. Um, okay. My dad and I bonded over a little tiny bit of music. My dad was such an odd person in some ways. He, his, he owned one cassette tape, which was a bootleg copy of Shaft in Africa. And, what? That's amazing. That's so strange. Such yeah. a specific thing, you know what I mean? Like, it's like well, if, you're, 
<laughs> yeah, if you're into that, you're probably into like a thousand other things. But he didn't care, didn't own music, and like waited for, you know, his ten year old son to get a thrift shop tape deck to one day say, "Hey, will you play this tape for me?" Which just blew my, my mind. So, um, oh. yeah, no, the the music thing, um, I think was, um, I think naturally I'm inclined towards it. But uh, when we landed in California, um, right away I became friends with a couple. A, a, a pair of twin brothers in my school who were, who were in my class. And um, they had an older brother, much older than them, like 10 years older than them, who had a massive record collection. Okay. And they had a dad who was a sales rep for Warner Brothers, who oh. literally was the guy going around, like Damn. handing out Coke at record stores to get records on the shelves. Literally. Oh, sure. Was that. So we would get records we would get ACDC records before they hit the shelves. We would like these kids and, and, and me by association within a couple of years, we just get piles of records all the time for free promos from, from Damn. major labels. We're spoiled. And so I was, I was off and running with a, a record obsession early on. And thanks to their older brother's collection um, being there in the house and he had moved away. We just, we had, we had total access to this massive collection of records. So that was, that was my schooling, especially on the Beatles. The Beatles was like what I would take home with me and, and sort of absorb 200% of, and then take them back a few days later and get the other ones yeah. or whatever. So yeah, yeah. It, was, um, it was great, but that's, that's really where it started. And fr from that point on, I was off and running. I got obsessed with KROQ, which is a big um, yep. radio station in LA. I guess yeah. still is. Was it Rodney on the Rocks or that was Rodney the, the Rock. show? Yeah. Okay, I remember yeah. reading about him in Flipside. Yeah. As a kid. I mean, he's, yeah, he's obviously legendary. Um, you know, in those days, the whole station, 24 hours a day, was playing what we now would consider awesome music. You know, they weren't sure. playing they weren't playing Limp Bizkit and, and that kind of thing. They, they weren't, you know, uh, they, they were sort of the forefront of New Wave and that kind of thing, and they, they actually were breaking a lot of groups in America. I imagine, um, well, I don't know very much about how radio really works. I know it's gotten much more, um, you know, boiled down into a few like mega companies and that, and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I'm, I don't even, so I, I don't know if K-Rock is Clear Channel now or what, but, but regardless, back then, it seemed mm -hmm. totally renegade. It it's seemed- like a Wild West to it in a degree, you know, especially when you hear stories of old country folks like you know like cash era and around there you know it was like they seriously would have to go around with 45s to radios like radio stations oh yeah against totally. them to play it yeah yeah and k-rock i think um you know i mean they started out playing they were the first state rod in the rock was the first person to ever play van halen you know what i mean sure. like it, it, yeah it, it, wasn't, it kind of was coming early on from this random place but by the by the time i was aware of music and the in the early 80s it was it was um particularly with rock and the rock was totally spearheading um mm -hmm. what we would now call underground music or, what, or whatever totally. and not but you know and a lot of mainstream music too i mean depeche mode and the cure groups like that were all were constantly being played but uh, it's yeah. also the first place i ever heard Minutemen, and the dead kennedys and a, a million groups like that too you know totally I mean, in California was like, I mean, I, I remember at least being, you know, hearing about Rodney being like the person who brought punk to the U.S. And then yeah. like, when, you know, like the first like underground label I fell in love with was Discord because of just like they had to do things on their own because no one's putting out anything for them. And so hearing about their early trips, like when Ian and Henry would like take a bus to California to see Dead Kennedys and stuff oh, yeah. like that. It's like, yeah. and then I, I would on my own, like over the years, I started to realize it's like, well, there's a reason why a lot of this early death rock sounded the way it did. And a lot of that crossover into like punk, like with like Rick Agnew and like, you know, adolescence and then Christian death at the time like that. I was like, it is surfy, but it's got this chorusy and like echoey sound to it that gives it a completely different feel. And, mm -hmm. and that's where it kind of came relative with like stuff that, you know, that I wasn't, you know, that I can hear that at least that you've done are things that you like. And I was just wondering if that was perhaps maybe some of like, where it came from, like just your surroundings or like something like Rodney on the Rocks or whatever. For sure, the Rodney on the Rock thing cannot be understated at all. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, and I, and I imagine, like I used to record the show. So the, so really totally. the only, the only, um, I, I haven't listened to those tapes in decades, but the only <laughs> stuff that I, this weekend. 
<laughs> right? I think that they would bring. In fact, I think if I if I try to play them, that they wouldn't actually survive that. Disintegrate. But um, yeah, I, I I memorized the groups that I recorded because I could because I had because that was the luxury of having it recorded. Yeah, I can't. Even, God knows what else I heard on that show that that I didn't record that I but I was first exposed to. I mean, it, it kind of like it's, it blows my mind to think about. But um, mm -hmm. but but um, having said that, like goth as a as a sort of sub part of all this um, didn't really um, get on my radar until that. Actually, I had a good friend. Some of my one of my best friends in California who I'd who you know I, I was certainly in touch with having moved to Colorado became obsessed with Roz Williams sure to the yeah. point where he started you know he looked a lot like Roz and actually even became friends with Roz yeah. and, and um did he dress so I had to, too? Like, he, uh, no, uh, no, <laughs> he I don't I wasn't around for most of it so it's certainly possible but I it's, there's le, there's definitely sure. photographic record of lots of mm. wildness let's put it that way um, so, but, so that whole thing was sort of on my, my periphery through him a little bit, mm -hmm. but I also, um, the, I love Bauhaus. Let me just say that for the record. That kind of probably goes without saying, but the, 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 the kind of like white makeup theatrics of goth never appealed to me very much. Mm -hmm. I'll, I hate Kiss and, um, to me, that's just a little too, too much like all that stuff. Did you say that? that I love like Kiss. I hate Kiss, yeah. Okay, cool. Because, like, there were one of these things where, it was, like, I had older brothers, too, 10 to 13 years older than I. So that's where, like, my kind of foundation was. Like, whatever right. they listened to, ACDC, Boston, Kiss. And as yeah. you know, clearly in, you know, 70s and 80s, Kiss owned everything, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And I just remember as a kid being, like, you know, intimidated by the album art and thinking they were going to be something way more cooler than what they were. Yeah, so Play exactly. their tapes or their records or their eight-track and just, like, this is it you know yeah. it wasn't until like maiden where i actually felt like it's something felt different you know yeah well like, funny that you mentioned that because being a being kiss was lost on me till i got to the to the states so i was seven years old when i found out who kiss was mm -hmm. um not that it would have been necessarily that much earlier but anyway but you know <laughs> um but, the, but the, the kid on my block who was into kiss was into iron maiden too and okay. so i was discovering those two things at the same time <clears throat> Iron Maiden was clearly way more intense, way more. They came um, something real. It sounded like it sounded genuine musically, as opposed to like yeah, you know, you're really. But it was also vicious and and kind of scary yeah. and like had, yeah. you know killers the, uh, and these these other record you know peace of mind all these things with Eddie and this like totally. these awful situations that he's in. I mean, <laughs> and now what's what are they gonna do to him this time? I know, right? So it's like. <laughs> that stuff was way more intense. The music was way more for real. And like, you know, Dr. Love, rock and roll all night. Give me a break. That stuff was like, was I mean, it's, it's like half a chromosome away from disco. You know what I mean? And, and, and then they after, did do disco. And well, yeah, they did do up. disco. Like, yeah. I understand being swept up in that if you're the right age and, and loving sure. that stuff. Absolutely. Sure. I totally get it. I get why people love them, but they're just not for me. Like, and that's what's and that's what's funny because like same time period you know or even just a few years after kiss was like like you were saying like there was like van halen and i remember in my you know when i was young my ears to like hearing van halen they sounded different than any other rock yeah. band too like yeah. they weren't conventional at all there were sounds that they were creating on those first two records that i was like that doesn't even sound like a guitar this is like it is it is creepy because it's like I can't figure out what it was, and so I had like way more respect for Van Halen than I did Kiss, and they didn't need any makeup. They dressed silly, but they were they murdered live in their own way, you know. Absolutely, they did. They they were they were killer. For I mean, I love Arena Rock, you know. Like, yeah, I'm not embarrassed. I love Van Halen up until Sammy Hagar. At that point, it's absolutely all bets are off. Like, I was the same, you know. I just was like, can't do it. Sorry. Yeah, I don't love. I don't love 1984. It's not. I, it's not, yeah. you know, it's pop and it's polished and it's got synth all over it. But I love Diver Down. And that record's mostly covers, yeah. but that's that record came out. That record landed when I was ten years old, kind of at the moment I found out about Van Halen. And I'm like, sure, okay, it's just one of those records for me that's like part of my DNA. I'm, I will always love it. 
1984 is appropriately named. It sounds like fucking 1984. Like yeah. it sounds like 84. So, yeah. so, Absolutely. so, um, moving along, you eventually got into, uh, you, you went to college in Boulder. Is that okay. where you started to kind of, is, so is that when you started playing music in general, like your first bands or? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right out of high school, I didn't do much. I, I knew I wanted to take a break. I hadn't, I hadn't done well in school. I was really disengaged and um, becoming more and more preoccupied with, with music and, and punk culture. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so um, yeah, I, I moved, eventually you know, moved down into Boulder. Um, uh, first of all, into a fraternity house that was vacant for the summer and would um, sublet these disgusting little dorm rooms for a hundred dollars. So sure. uh, a friend and I moved into one of those places and, and actually, yeah, he and I were in the process of starting the first band that I was in. So that, that sort of uh, dovetailed with me leaving home and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I didn't start going to school for a couple of years. Um, What'd you go to my school grade for? really bad in high school. So I had to, I had to attend junior, I had to attend like, you know, um, like a local junior college sort of thing, community okay. college. Sure. In order to get my grades up and, and transfer into the university in Boulder. Uh, so during the couple of years that I was doing that, I was playing in bands and starting to, um, so my, my roommate and bandmate was a guy named Bob Robb, okay. who was a couple of years older than me. And um, he wound up going, moving away for a few years to uh, moving, actually to the South, ironically enough. And um, so his absence sort of passed the baton to me as the guy in Boulder doing shows okay. for a lot of groups. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I found myself sort of at the center of this, all this activity with doing that. And, you know, it was just more and more bands all the time, uh, more and more stuff coming through and, um, uh, but, but actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Bob, Bob and I were still, Bob was still in Boulder. We started, we started, um, actually, the second band I was in was a group called Savalas. That, and, okay. I recently found out about that group within the last okay. so many years. And I was like, oh, shit, he was in this other group. <laughs> so. Yeah, we were, um, you know, it was very uh, um, Rites of Spring and Embrace um, indebted to those groups i think and sam i am that kind of thing that was going to starting to happen yep. um but um because of bob's presence in the group and and the fact I and mean, he'd been doing shows for years he'd started doing shows when he was like 15 or 16 in the mid 80s in the like around i think 87 88 oh, okay. um and so savalas had the luxury of playing with everybody for a couple of years i mean I literally any almost any band that came to Colorado, we'd play with them somewhere or we'd play with them in Wyoming or, or wherever, yeah. you know, somewhere within a few hour drive. Okay. And um, so I just got to meet tons of people. And when he let, when Bob left to go do his thing for a few years somewhere else, um, I just sort of took, grabbed the ball and ran with it. And um, at some point in there, you know, uh, well, when Bob left, Savalas, Savalas ended, Angel Hair started and, um, <clears throat> Somewhere along that line, I became, I, I got into the university and then I, um, I think the second year I was there, I took over running the nightclub there, okay. which um, sort of, I don't know, legitimized my status as a promoter, sort of. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just allowed me to do. Yeah. You were the one to contact. <laughs> What's that? You were the one who was to be contacted if the fans were coming through. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, well, you know, to a degree, especially for, definitely for Boulder. Um, De Denver was yeah. Denver was big enough where it was always a few different people doing stuff, and you know, sure. we would collaborate, what have you. But it was also a time where there was a lot of like, you know, a lot of money coming into alternative music, and a lot of um, like early '90s then, right? Yeah, '94, '95. Like, yep. um, you know, it went from putting on a show for, you know, Rancid, for example, being um, a great opportunity to hang out with my old buddies from California and their new band that's coming through, et cetera, et cetera, to being like this whole laundry list of 
agents and other people that we're required to deal with and all these rules that we have to follow in order to do their show. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean to pick on them by any. No, they were just like one of examples of many that was yeah. happening at the time. I completely, you know, I, I hear you. I've had an experience of my own like that and it's yeah. intimidating. So, <laughs> absolutely it is. And it started, you know, that was the first um, inkling that some of this stuff might be getting like not so fun or not so, uh, you know, community minded or mm -hmm. re reciprocal or whatever. It just felt like, oh, I'm being told to do something by it business you know, yeah things like that things that were uh you know that just don't don't sit well when you're used to diy culture and that kind of thing too many cooks in the kitchen at that point especially someone who's not welcomed you know like we don't know yeah, well, well, yeah exactly them, i mean you know and yeah i mean i was like literally having to like submit flyers for review for for, for <laughs> you know, things like that wow um, i'm demoing yeah, for a well, show <laughs> yeah demoing flyers um, being forced to do uh, radio spots for a show that was going to sell out regardless of the radio show, but we'd have to do that. It was going to, it was going to sell out regardless of radio spots, but we were forced to do radio spots wow. so that the band would have a presence on radio for the show. Damn. Just stuff like that. Like people thinking about the mechanisms of marketing and stuff and all this yeah. background, frankly, bullshit. Yeah. That we're all used to now that we're all, um, <laughs> um, cogs in the wheel of every day on social media but back then it was like the first stages of like oh we want you to um, associate our product this way with yourself and with other people it's just like for sure my, my first experiences of that was volunteering for this place called the cattle club in sea city and it was after the first kind of like all age places that's where i would be like you know everyone from like dog face herman trench mouth like ulysses bikini kill played there like Okay. And Cattle Club was right after that, about a year or so after, and I was a volunteer, and that's how I got to meet people, where it was like um, meeting every band that was coming in, and I would just like pick at their brain, like, how did you do this? Like, how did you get a tour going and all this? Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, and then it got to be the point where this guy Pete, Pete Phillips, he was the one who was primarily doing a lot of the booking then, and he would want to know, you know, definitely was trying to help out with people like myself, who was like, wasn't really into a lot of the bands coming through, and they're like, well, what about this band or that? It's just like, well, we're going to have to deal with an agent like that. Mm -hmm. you know, and he'll be him like battling with them, like bringing down the guarantee and trying to do this and just being like, look, it's going to be a packed house full of enthusiastic kids who are going to be buying all their merch, mm -hmm. you know? But yeah, it was well, weird. It was weird. You know, well, that wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything post Nirvana at that point, it was just like, everyone had to be like, just, washed or signed or like some a and r person would be coming around and just like hawking bands you know like just peering and like it was weird it was a weird period and i was still too young to really be like you know i'm like 16 17 to really fully yeah. understand everything i just knew i had an interest and it wasn't really on that side as much i uh I, I, as an anecdote I often find myself telling about running that club on campus at that time was um, exactly in the era that you're talking about, symptomatic of what we're saying, what we're talking about here with all these different, yeah, cooks in the kitchen, managers and, and uh, you know, so, it, so in Denver, there was, you know, there's the historical kind of Red Rocks mm -hmm. scene and a big concert scene and, and those people, they concerts and they're, and their employees or affiliated companies started, you know, post Nirvana and Green Day, everything started, Offspring, what have you, started paying a lot more attention to what was going on with smaller groups. They started booking groups, uh, groups who are were, who were way below their radar, just to, just to start this disgusting process of having history with a group, right? Oh, so these, sure. yeah. these big yeah. promoters were doing shows that were, not at all worth their time because they were convinced that these bands that were nobodies would be back in six months with a hit on the radio and that they would have to come to them and they'd have them for Red Rocks because they did their show at, you know, wherever. Yeah, they wanted that notoriety, that flyer to prove exactly. it. Like, see, we did that show in 93. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. And the agents would be hand-tied because if once, you've, once you've done a show with someone in a, in a market, as they say, you are, you are obliged to go back to them until they say no or they can't do your show. That's just, the cult. that was the etiquette back then. I don't know if it's still the same way or not. 
Right, you know. right. But um, anyway, so to cut a long story a little bit shorter, fake concerts came to us when I was running the club. The club had a capacity of 157. It was tiny. Legal capacity or like that's how much you can fit in? The club was called Club 156 because that was the room number, but oh, it had funny. a capacity of 157 legally. We could <laughs> wow. squeeze in, yeah, you could squeeze in two, 250 people probably. Okay. Um, but anyway, we booked the show for, for fake concerts with the group Ash. You remember them? Yeah. Yep. They're Irish. They're actually, I think they're still around. They were sort of like the Irish Green Day or, or something. <laughs> and then um, two, other, two other groups of the time that had a, a one name name, a one word name with a, oh, yeah. an yep. oval logo. You know, there's, there's like thousands of them. And anyway, some typeset on a computer, like <laughs> yeah, you know, like, some intern I, like slits, <laughs> compressed the type, did something with font you're never supposed to do, and like they, that was the logo for the band. And uh, anyway, these three bands showed up to play this club in a massive tour bus. Wow, that's and, expensive too. Daily, holy shit! Oh yeah, and they tried to turn this tour bus like a hairpin turn into our driveway into the student center on campus. And, and basically jackknifed it on the, on, the, on the sidewalk and held up traffic for like six hours. Created what? this huge incident in Boulder just so these bands that were nobody can ride in a tour bus. I mean, the whole thing was like so comedic and I should have been out there like filming it. And couldn't be I mean, any more spinal nowadays, tap. Be Could not be any more what? spinal tap than that. Dude, exactly. I mean, it was, <laughs> and the, the, ba the bands were, of course, mortified. They felt so stupid. And, you know, there was like five people at the show. And they were cool. the, guy, the guys were cool. They were just like, man, you know, how do we get ourselves into this situation? Kind of I remember one of them talking to one of them for hours that night, and he was, you know, about all kinds of stuff. He was just a cool guy, but he was genuinely embarrassed. And sure, yeah. Right. They would have taken a cab there if they could have, you know. <laughs> yeah, man, they should have all been in one, like, 12-passenger van, all three vans. No shit, no shit. You know? So, like, uh, I guess with, um, you know, you're in your – you're in college, you're doing shows now, you're witnessing this transition. You started Angel Hair with folks. Um, so I guess go from there. Like, you know, like what was it, you know, I know that you've, you've I know you've been through Omaha, Nebraska because that's how I found out about you guys uh, through yeah, yeah. Russell's old band opening up. And then it was like, that was yeah. for me and people my age, just like, there's this label called Gravity and everything's like five or six bucks for 12 inches and everything is clearly handmade and this, mm -hmm dude who sang he didn't sing he just screamed <laughs> like you know and it was yeah. and that was my introduction was that gravity seven inch and then just going backwards it's like who the fuck what is this it, you know so how did who's how did that all come inch? what's that heroin or who, who's gravity seven inch ours or, or heroin angel hair yeah angel so, hair. so so i was going back and you know and then like ah okay got, right. got like the splits you know and everything like the bare minimum split was the next one i purchased and so okay. i was like okay so this is clearly like older angel hair perhaps you know and so i was just trying to figure it all out there isn't any bios there isn't any glossies going back to like kind of like what we were talking about in our experiences yeah. there's just like this blown out photo that's maybe this big of the band live <laughs> and i started to notice that pattern when i'd go to omaha and sioux falls to buy more gravity stuff and branching off into like vermiform records and everything and i was like mm -hmm. there's clearly an aesthetic that i love and i love that i don't know anything about these people yeah there isn't any interviews yeah. anywhere like I love that it was, it almost felt like a secret, you yeah, know? Absolutely. That's, that was, the, I couldn't agree with you more. And it was, yeah, it was really exciting to be part of that. Absolutely. Um, Angel, Angel Hair took a long time to get off the ground. Um, uh, myself and the guitar player, Andy Arrowhood. Um, okay. yep. We started it um, in the fall of 92. He moved to Boulder to be an engineering student. Um, my, aforementioned roommate Bob had moved uh, to Alabama um, and uh, Savalas had sort of imploded at the end of the tour of our last tour and um, anyway so uh, you know Angel Hair persevered for about a year about a year and a half we just were we were just going through members we couldn't we couldn't keep the same lineup together for more than a month or two um, not really for any other reason than everybody was in school yeah, um, you're young you know, everyone's like, young. Everyone had a, you know, um, uh, I, I, I would, I would say everyone had a million things going on, and I guess they did. But I, I, as an adult, I know it's much harder to get a band together now than it was then. 
even though everybody was in school full time. Sure. Um, you know, and a few people had jobs and that kind of stuff, but it was like, um, it just was, I, I'm not sure, in hindsight, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the turnover was caused by, but um, we went through quite a lot of people in that band, but eventually, um, you know, the, the lineup solidified and um, we, uh, well, the, con the connection to gravity came about because, um, uh, so let me back up a little bit. When, Sav when Savalas was, was getting ready to do uh, a tour in the spring of um, 1991, we were getting ready to put out our, uh, actually we hadn't even gotten to the point where we were gonna put out a record yet. We just had a demo tape. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, right, right about Christmas um, before that, three months before, um, a guy showed up in Boulder who I didn't know, but it, uh, his mom lived in Boulder and through a mutual friend of ours in California, he got my phone number. Um, his, his name was Dave Whitcraft and he uh, wound up, um, he's, uh, a lot of people in the Bay Area know who he is, he's still around. Um, and he uh, back, back then produced a little zine called Boredom. Uh, and I think that was sort of his calling card for me was the fact that he made this zine. And Anyway, he came over to our house in Boulder and he had a little satchel with him and he sat down in my bedroom and pulled out these seven inches yeah. and one of them was the first heroin record and we sat there and listened to it and i um you know i, I was familiar with hardcore but I, this was like a different take on it you know what i mean this was sort of like reinventing what was already feeling like old-fashioned hard hardcore yeah. punk you know what i mean and the, the, the normal the structure the paint by number feeling of it yeah um so he left this record with me and um we wrote the address on it uh when the time came a, a few weeks later to start booking this tour and um we got a reply and <clears throat> when the tour rolled around in, in march we wound up you know getting to play at the che cafe with uh with rice and heroin wow Wow. <laughs> Which was, That's awesome. Fuck. You know, uh, it was incredible. And I mean, the show was unforgettable and um, just in, in so many ways felt like plugging into something for the first time. Like exactly. something that, you know, like just, a, just there was just a, an energy there that none of us had ever experienced before. Even mm -hmm. the amount of shows we'd been to, or or in some cases, like actually put on in Colorado, all the shows we played and that kind of thing. This was just like a different thing. Yeah, and it had this. Yeah. Yep. it had this momentum going, and there was some, um, you know, this was like gravity barely even existed then. In fact, um, the first that the paper bag heroin seven inch I think mm -hmm. came out um, right uh, very soon after that. In fact. That record may have actually just been coming out at the time that show happened. Like ninety one or something, or ninety. This would have been this would have been March of ninety two. Ninety two. Okay. Yeah, March ninety two, okay. and um, so yeah. So anyway, we played with them, and it, it wasn't any. Uh, you know, the show went fine and stuff, and um, we all you know were were friendly, but there was no great. Um, Revol revolution or revelation took place that night or anytime that soon after that things just kind of went on for a while but um i did stay in touch with the, the guys from from heroin um particularly scott who organized the show and of course matt who was doing the label gravity and um at the end of the year let me think now uh so no a year later 93 um your future kind of took um, your future sorry angel hair took the summer off <laughs> Um, the Angel Hair was inactive for the summer of 93 and he was doing something. So I went on, I took a road trip to California with my girlfriend and we were walking up the street in Encinitas and bump into Scott from Heroin, who insists that we come and stay at his house, which we did do. And um, he was telling me all about his new group that hadn't recorded yet called Click Attack Katawi. And um, another incredible could, man. Couldn't remember the name to save my life. I should have like was like constantly like, uh, like what? <laughs> I just you know? I just always kind of reference it in my mind as Ricky Ticky Tabby, like the Ricky Ticky Tabby band. Yeah. You know, I'm not even going to try to 
<laughs> say the name. Somebody but. in Boulder called him that too. So when I hear that, <laughs> like, I think that that's awesome. Name. That's awesome. Um, and uh, anyway, you know, at the end of that year, um, they, on the strength of their demo tape, uh, toured like the western half of the U.S. And so I organized a show for them in Boulder, very last minute. I mean, I'm talking about like the call came after Christmas for a show on January 4th kind of thing. Like, yeah, so yeah. incredibly like, I, you like know. We're on tour. We're, we're near you <laughs> within days. Well, basically, yeah. It was like, it was, it was almost that. It was almost that, yeah, um, yeah. that last minute. And uh, uh, anyway, the, to cut a long story short, they broke down and we drove down to Colorado Springs and got them. Mm. Uh, and uh, the show that happened the next day is actually on YouTube and is a, is a kind of a legendary show for all of us in the sort of Boulder, Denver scene, as it were. Sure, sure. Um, and then, um, you know, as luck would have it because of them not having a van anymore and being stuck in the middle of this tour in the middle of the winter in a snowstorm. Um, I had the whole group with, with Matt from, from gravity there with them as roadie, um, hostage basically in my house for like three days. So naturally we got around to listening to angel hair and, um, that's where this whole relationship started. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And um, he was like, well, when you guys come to California, next time let's do something and so we were out there three months later and that's when we recorded that ep and um yeah yeah that's awesome <laughs> lots of bumps in the road after that sure <laughs> but, but no i remember um but yeah it was the show at the Capitol in omaha that uh fisher opened up with russell white's old band that uh when he introduced to myself and then we just put it on mixtapes like crazy because by that time i was already into like Jehu big time like I right. love Jehu and um I remember explaining it to people I was like it's like Jehu but on like meth you know <laughs> like I was like it's got the chaos of the guitars you know of Jehu but it's like it's it's kind of more of a whirlwind and it's it, like I couldn't really explain it and like I remember when I first time I had seen the art for the gravity seven inch like it wasn't even like what I would expect at all and I was kind of just like blown away that like something that sounded like this, you know, it was like, this is clearly handmade, hand screened, you know, all the inserts and everything, the, like, it was, it was really inspiring. Cause I was like a junior in high school. Uh, yeah. I was a junior in high school and I was doing like mm -hmm. offset printing. So it gave me more confidence to be like, well, let's fucking print our own covers, you know, like, well, <laughs> yeah. We'll, yeah, yeah. Well, we should make our own shirts like this. Cause even when you see their shirts, like it was the coolest, like, you just screen printed over some like random t-shirt find. And I remember there was one for a, an angel hair one, my friend got, and it was like a Colorado shirt. It was like, I can't remember what it was like Brown or something. And then there was like a little like colors that went across and a silhouette of maybe a deer or whatever. It's Colorado. But then it had that angel hair punk screened over it. And mm. that's like all these things. I was like taking notes. I'm like, this is cool. This would, this wouldn't cost shit to do. And it looks right. neat and it's unique. So that you 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 guys definitely put a, a, a planted a seed in my brain then you know in my high school band because I was like, well that's that's amazing to hear. I love hearing stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I will uh, lift the curtain just a tiny bit on one thing, um, and I'm sure you can appreciate this because it's still just as fascinating. Um, although a lot of the gravity twelve inches are self screened. And certainly a lot of the seven inches too. It seemed like a small amount though. There were only like a handful in the whole catalog, it seemed like, right? Like um, yeah, later on he got into any and stuff like yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And later on it was just easier to do regular full color printing or whatever. Sure. Yeah, of course. But, um, part of the, the reason the gravity stuff is has such an interesting tactile quality to it, um, mm -hmm. is that Matt was working in, actually in a print shop. So there was the silkscreen stuff, and that was largely done at home with him and Andy Ward from Evergreen and Andy Ocaro. They would, the two of them together would silkscreen thousands of record jackets. Yeah. But then Matt also, um, he had bought a Power, a Power Mac and was familiarizing himself with Photoshop and probably Quark Express or some other layout yep. thing. And um, so he would design stuff digitally or even on paper cut and paste um 
and then actually printed on an offset press, but using methods that made it feel handmade. For example, like those Mohinder uh, covers that he did, like they, they literally, with a paper cutter, cut out magazine squares of magazines for like months and months to get a few thousand of those squares. Sure. Yeah. But then he actually ran those squares through a printing press. Okay. To actually have silk sil screen would have been such a mess, and the paper was so thin and so delicate. Um, actually, turned out better really offset printing them. Got it. Um, that's the case. That was actually the case with our record, that jacket, the, with the punk guy. Um, yeah. He kind of was deliberating about which way to do it and went with the offset because it just was going to be clean. And um, That makes and, sense now. Because like, I, I, I think of like some other seven inches that did more than like two colors even. For, yeah. That it was clearly silk screen and you felt it. You know, you yeah. could feel it. And like, it, while it was really cool and stuff, yeah, I could see what you're saying now. It was definitely offset. But it, it you know, it, it definitely like, it, it had it that blurred the line between handmade and 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 mass produced or or yeah you know, you know, yeah clearly or any other number of things so yeah i took a huge cue from him with that and the the used t-shirt thing i don't even really remember where that idea came from but i i, I would think almost undoubtedly it had to do with that it was like our response to the paper bag seven yeah. inch i'm sure well it was brilliant because it saved you know, one of my bands for a handful of tours, you know, like we just did a, just the, by the pound, like, you know, like <laughs> whatever it was, you know, like what, yeah. where would where could we do this and just fill a screen with like various images and we'd be like, I don't know, let's try this combo this time. But yeah, it was fucking great. It was really the first cool. couple of VSS tours. We had a, we got a, we, we were doing the same thing, but we, mm -hmm. um, I had one of those. It was from that Self-titled seven inch. The yeah, white one. exactly. Exactly. I had, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> we thought we would take it up or like uh, I don't know, um, stylize the idea a little bit. So for that thing, we only did button-down shirts. Yep. And uh, we got a clothes rack and arranged them all in order, like you'd see at Goodwill or something, in, in, a, in like the you know descending colors. The color wheel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So and we just thought we were so clever, and uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was respected, you know. Like you, it was cool. There's, there's these I, I I actually remember it smelling not so great um, when they would get in the van and get really hot. That whole like thrift shop. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thing would start to come out, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mid mid middle of summer tours in the South and Midwest was yeah. not the best sometimes, but we did. Yeah. It. <laughs> so so okay, so we come up to like gravity, getting some inspiration knowing mm -hmm. how to handle some things uh band eventually dies out so um were you still living in boulder when angel hair finished or did yeah. you reload okay and so like yeah. how so so what how much time was i think it was almost was it almost immediate within like a year or so when then vss started or was okay. it simultaneous or it was it was it was it was weeks i mean okay. uh the last Angel Hair show, I think, was on January 3rd or 4th, and the first VSS show was in March. Nice. So um, we wasted no time. And, uh, you know, we, I think we really whipped ourselves into shape quickly because um, Swing Kids and Still Life were coming to Boulder, and yeah. uh, we didn't want to um, be part of that. And uh, so that just kind of, like, lit a fire, I think, that made it happen that much more you know quickly but we were also i think eager to like keep the momentum going because angel hair really you know at right that at point end, yeah it just hit, sure. this, hit this thing that felt like you know hitting our stride or, or whatever and then it was like, gone and so i think there was a a rush to kind of like you know keep the momentum going yeah. Yeah. yeah no and i remember like uh it was the um split with titari that yeah. i heard first then went to the white one and then the gravity seven inch. And I remember like, you know, this is a departure from angel hair, but you know, vocally I could still tell it was you, but it was like, it, even then it was still really hard to put your finger on. Like it was, it was difficult to explain to people once again, but yeah, it was. And I mentioned this, you know, recently when we were chatting on like Facebook about this, but that two year gap and then nervous circus comes out. It was just like, <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> like what happened in that two-year period of time like that's a lot of time though at the same time when you're in a band you know two years 
it's forever man it's like now two years feels like nothing 20 years oh I mean, two years like just, that's when our next full is going to come out or you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> um we matured a lot as people in those two years and i think we definitely got um you know um there was a certain element of escaping small town and you know going out to the big city and all of the kind of uh various slaps of reality that hit you once you do something like that i mean at least for me i, I can't speak for the other guys but that's definitely where where my head was um making nervous circuits and um was that in berkeley then were you living in berkeley I, well i lived in berkeley but okay. everybody else lived in um either in san francisco or in josh's case like way down in the burbs near san jose oh okay he had, a, he had a tech job so he was he was down there um but yeah, I mean, the, you know, it's funny to hear you say that because the early VSS stuff was very tentative. Uh, mm. We, we, what we, what we, what we made up for in bravado, I think we were lacking in confidence a little bit. Like, I think we, okay. we kind of faked. <clears throat> I think for the angel hair was a really big pair of shoes to, to try and fill, right? And uh, musically speaking, we felt like our drummer Paul was the backbone of the group. Um, and Boulder was not awash with great punk rock drummers, okay? Uh, we knew that we couldn't keep doing Angel Hair without him, which is why it ended. Sure. And we knew yeah. we couldn't do another band on the same, Anywhere, anywhere remotely close to Angel Hair without being compared to him, to that, yeah. um, and also Dave, who was who became our who was our drummer, um, was at that point still a guitar player, and and yep. learned the that. drums to to join the VSS, and that was part of our whole. Um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say the mission or anything, but part part of our mo, I guess, was to sort of. Um, you know, Dave's presence as a new drummer infused it with this kind of like, you know, sort of, I don't want to say naivety because it wasn't, but almost a, a kind of a, a primitiveness or, a, or a, a tendency towards basicness that we felt. Less is more. Yeah. You no, know, it was exactly. powerful. He used primarily floor toms, didn't he? Or, yeah, he sure yeah. did. Yeah. And like rides primarily. So it yeah. was. I think it was the less is more where it's like he's adding power in other areas that your the drummer from Angel Hair didn't do because his was he was so hyper. Yeah. And there was like this craziness to it in Whirlwind where Dave was way more like it's it's it like these there's these like two to three transitions, but it was very tribal, you right. know. And that's what I really liked about it. It was like I you know, it's obviously gonna force you to to structure your songs differently and a place vocally and everything, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so it was at that moment, I think m even more like, uh, <clears throat> I think it was at that moment that we all allowed influences of ours that we had probably all had forever anyway, mm. um, especially through angel hair and stuff to, to like come to the, to the forefront a little bit more. So um, read. yeah, I mean, we really, as a group, um, were totally fascinated with with Gary Newman, Two Way Army, um, big time. Bauhaus, of course, um, to one degree or another, The Doors. Um, I mean, I think that that's really evident in Andy's playing, but it's also, um, you know, I love The Doors because I love Echo and the Bunnymen, and like got into them because through that, you know what I mean? Like I see the yeah. the, the lineage to those things, and like. Um, so yeah, uh, and to a huge extent, public image limited, especially metal oh, block. Like, pill, pill over sex pistols for me any day. Yeah, I'm for sure. Sex pistols fan. For sure. Pill, sure, the, pill was so <laughs> influential in regards to just like how to view a group, you know, like it doesn't Absolutely. have to be this rock band and like the infamous interview with, uh, um, on tomorrow. Yeah. Bill Rundy. God. Oh, wait, that, was the, that was the sex pistols. Never mind. You're talking about the thing with um, Dan, Dan, is it Dan Snyder or whatever, Tom Snyder show? Tom Snyder, yeah, it was called Tomorrow. But yeah. that interview was mind-blowing, but it's just like, you know, like there's still these punks, but they're trying to, they're, 
they're trying to explain, you know, like this grand idea and it's still difficult at the time because people are still like trying to grasp their brain, you know, grasp punk or, you yeah. know, and they can't figure out like, what do you mean film? What do you mean playing behind like a movie screen? Like, right. what do you mean right. a company, <laughs> you know, that five, so you cool. know, that wave your hair in the breeze, platform, ditty stuff. <laughs> like, Have you seen yeah. this, um, this new uh, documentary about him? I have not. Him. No, I have not. No. It's about, I guess it's about PIL more than it is about John Lydon. Oh, uh, I saw a trailer I'd for it. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Oh, man, it looks good. Yeah, I gotta check it out. Um, but yeah, so we, we definitely, I mean, I remember the, I remember my own sense of being out on a limb after, after, you know, our, the Angel Hair LP that we recorded didn't come out right away. It actually came out after the VSS was touring and we would sell it on tour. It was like 97. Um, it came out in no, the LP came, it was recorded at the end of 94 and came out in mid-95. 95, okay, yeah, I was a, okay, I was a senior. Okay, I remember this. Um, but it was weird because, you know, we had made this record um, for, you know, the group that made the album, a lot of people didn't even realize had broken up, okay? And so we, the first couple of VSS tours were sort of booked on the strength of, oh, well, this is Angel Hair, you know, even though it wasn't, but that's yeah. kind of what the thing was like. And sure. we would show up with the, you know, with the, a bunch of songs that were nothing like Angel Hair. And then we had the audacity to sell the Angel Hair LP at the merch table because we didn't have a record of our own. And um, I've so, done it before. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. It was weird. It was, I remember feeling like uh, uh, just a real sense of unease from, from having gone from, from a situation where we were so sure of ourselves, such a gang, such a, you know, just we felt like we were invincible and we made this record that um, I still am very proud of. Uh, and to go from something like that with that much confidence to a situation where we feel like maybe the emperor, the people, people are going to, our, our audience might think the emperor doesn't have any clothes kind of thing. And then, mm -hmm. um, it was very, a, a very uneasy time. Um, yeah. By the, by the time that group, by the time that Gravity EP came out, um, I guess our, our, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe our playing had, had caught up to us or something, or maybe we were just doing what we're doing better, or maybe, maybe the six month gap or whatever had, had caught up or something, but that, that EP sort of signaled people becoming okay with it if that makes any oh, sense. The Gravity 7-ish for BSS? Yeah. Yeah, that was sick. Did, was that, I, for some reason, I was under the understanding that that was the same re recording session as the split with Tatari, or am I wrong? Yeah. Completely? No, you're absolutely right. Okay. You're absolutely right. So, yeah, yeah those were all recorded uh, with Matt in, in San Diego with the intention of being a 12-inch for Gravity. Oh, shit. Okay. But he, um, he, he took a while to convince that the VSS was a was a uh, was worthy of his stamp of approval, yeah. and I don't I don't fault him for that because right out the gate I think we were probably a little bit of a mess. And I probably pretty think, respectful too, you know, like he's probably like knowing that you're going to be doing something good, but wants to wait until it's like you guys kind of yeah found yeah. your bearings or you know like kind of got things settled to where you're comfortable, like you were saying, you know, confident. Yeah. And he didn't wash his hands with us, of us entirely. I mean, he did put out those songs that he put out, but um, you know, it, that 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 dovetails as well with with his own personal life kind of becoming um, a mess. And so we, uh, I wouldn't say that we were um, those two things were mutually exclusive to each other, but yeah. they. Uh, conspired at the time for us to sort of um uh for the first time in a couple of years we felt like we were i don't know sort of free agents not like it's not like we'd ever signed a contract with matt you know yeah. it was not kind of like of, on your own again you know you're kind yeah, of, yeah. he was sort of like he was uh, he wasn't that into what we were doing and he was also dealing with a bunch of personal sure. yeah like, so 
we kind of just, um, you know, we, we did this few like sp split records and that kind of thing. And, and also there was a lot of, um, you know, things got tumultuous with the lineup of the group once we were in California. Um, our guitar player, Josh, who I mentioned having kind of a tech job. Sure. Le he left in the middle of 1996 for like six months. And so, um, you have to get a period of time to be gone, you know? Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't that long. I mean, he was back. He was back early enough for us to record the whole album before the end of that year. So I guess maybe he was only gone for three or four months, but you know, um, at the were time, it seemed like... songs off nervous circuits live as you were writing them, or did you just kind of hold on to them until you demoed or recorded we, them full length? Uh, we did play them live in the, we were only playing around the Bay area. Um, okay. We, played, well, we used to play Gilman street a lot, for example, mm -hmm. I, I feel like there was a moment where we were probably playing there like once every couple months. And um, we would play the Chameleon in San Francisco and the Kilowatt and other places okay. like that. So we were, um, yeah, we were sort of road testing songs. I remember we did a, we, there's somewhere there's a recording of us playing on the radio in Santa Cruz, I think maybe right after the, the, the album was done. Mm. Uh, but uh, we weren't really touring that much around then. Once we got the record done, we did a whole bunch of touring and then we broke up. Yeah, because I remember even, um, God, like, like once it came out, then just finally hearing that, like, they're on tour and they're coming through the Midwest. I was like, holy shit, you know? And so, like, my old band was able to jump on a couple shows. And then I remember it was like, it might have been that summer or whatever, but whoever was booking you was booking some bands from, like, Kill Rock Stars and such, too. Yeah, Chad. Chad, Chad, Chad yeah. He's, yeah. He's cool. He was a yeah. really cool person. Yeah, and I remember yeah. we were planning on doing a VSS show for you in Sioux City. And then he called and he's like, hey, you, should, uh, you left a voicemail, like you should call me, you know, kind of got some bad news about that, those oh, wow. potential dates. And he's like, yeah, they're done. And it, I was just like gutted because it was like, this band, I felt like, you know, it was like, I was able to, you know, I, was, I, I found out about Angel Hair, they were still a band, but they broke up. So I'm like, okay, whatever. And then it's like, okay, here's the new group. Then seeing like the growth of it, two years of nothing and then dropping this album and such and you know getting acquainted and then being super excited for this whatever else was coming out and I, I like at that time I, like, there was bands I really liked but there was you know it wasn't like so like Gravity and prior to them like Nation of Ulysses and like stuff like that that mm -hmm. blew my mind when I found out they broke up it was like fuck you're gutted you know yeah but yeah, that was, that was, that, that call sucked. <laughs> that was so like, well, for what's worth, I'm sorry. <laughs> nah, it happens. I mean, I get it. You know, I found, I found, I went on to find out exactly like uh, how bands operate and how things are firsthand. And so everything started to finally make sense as years went on, you know, sure. so. Sure. So, you know, so, okay, at this point, VSS is done. I know you've been in a handful of bands since then. Like, was it subpoena the past or like, where were you at in life once VSS is done? Like, like, yeah. So I, um, you know, part of the problem with the VSS, part of what broke us up, uh, broke us up was my own um, inability to deal very well with the stress of the businesses that I was running simultaneously to being in the band. Okay. So, um, to one degree, GSL, but to a much bigger degree, Bottleneck um, was. Uh, an everyday kind of, um, I don't want to call it a problem because it wasn't a problem. It, it, I mean, you know, it was, it was problematic for me to deal with, but I mean, the fact that it was successful and required attention every day was good. Um, yeah. But I, I would have to leave for a month or a month and a half on tour and um, leave things in other people's hands. Um, you probably know Mark Wilcox, actually. Yeah, yep. Yeah, so Mark was one of those people. Mark lives in California now because I lured him out to run Bottleneck while I was on tour. And um, and, and for those of you who are you know aren't familiar, um, like uh, the label that Sonny did, GSL, um, was gaining you know huge momentum because you were putting out releases that were like you know especially when you're doing like Locust Seven Inches and like. Right. That stuff, else. that's where this all, that's, that, this is right at that time. Yeah, like with Erica Records, because both you yeah. and Justin were going through Erica, and yeah. like stuff yeah. that 
Justin's putting out was doing really well. And then it just seemed like there was this idea was like the distribution through bottleneck. And I, I would order through Lumberjack. I'd order through bottleneck, you know, like there was these puzzle pieces that were fitting perfectly sure. for underground, you know, and like, I couldn't imagine okay. being in a band and doing both of those, especially at that time where it was like, you weren't putting out 200, you know, this is limited to 250 only. And then that's, that's the only printing or press of it as it is sometimes this way for people. No, like here's a thousand, yeah. here's yeah. 2000, here's another yeah. 3000, you know, like it was mass numbers. It really was. That was the golden age, man. Like back, back then, like <laughs> late, time. late nineties, like literally any record on a 45, you could sell, you could be, pretty pretty certain if you if you had a if you had a substantial distribution network in place you could be pretty sh certain of selling 1500 or 2000 copies of virtually anything yeah and a lot of it's for pre-sales yeah. too and i didn't find that yeah. out until about then like yeah. at the time like one of the labels we were on locally friends you know blood of the young and then through trouble man oh, yeah. and so they were both you know trouble man was already established blood of the young was gaining momentum and then it, you know seeing those numbers firsthand where it was just like even on when we we're doing seven inches of our own through friends, there were still like 300 or so, but then it's just like, now we're doing 1000 to 2000 pressings. Yeah. And yeah. didn't even flinch at it. That was just normal. No, I mean, it was, yeah, it was absolutely normal. And <laughs> that's bizarre to think about now. <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, God, yeah. thousand copies. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know how hard it's been to get rid of the, you know, the, the last record that I was part of had, I think, 250 or 300 copies made. And, like, I know they're not sold. And, yeah. Uh, you know, just, it really, put that puts it in perspective. But it was, you know, it was really the, just a wild, awesome time. And um, it was real exciting to be able to just, you know, I lo that's a, it's just a cool format. It's such a, you know, the 7 Inch is such a great, uh little you know um artifact you know yeah, the, seven inch, uh, the, the demo tape to the seven inch without yeah. even thinking about it twice in the 90s was like that's what it was uh, yeah yeah totally yeah totally. you're gonna put out totally. a seven inch even if you did it yourself like you just that was what you just did you didn't think yeah. twice about it now it's like i could put in an extra two to four hundred dollars and do a 12 inch yeah right you know yeah <laughs> So, so like, yeah, so I know that during all this time too, you're also doing graphic art design and such. So I guess maybe kind of bring yeah. in how so, that yeah, came so about. The, the, you know, I, once you start putting out groups like Locust, um, I started feeling a certain amount of um, pressure that might have been entirely internal. I'm definitely not going to place it on, on, on that group or any other band. Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt like I wasn't, really living up to my end of the bargain with them by being gone on tour a lot, especially on tours that were feeling, um, you know, for as, man, it's, it's so weird to put these things in perspective. Like it, it probably sounds ungrateful to say it now, but at the time, it's only been 24 as, years or so. Oh well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> as much, uh, as much work as we put into the VSS, we, you know, we didn't, within our lifetime as a group, we didn't see the, we didn't reap the, the rewards of that very much. We uh, threw in the towel before any of that really paid off. Um, but the last couple trips that we did, uh, I remember playing, going up the West Coast, the last, the, really the last thing that we did that could be called a tour was a, was a trip up to the mid, to the Northwest. And, I remember playing at Corvallis High School and blowing the power out, like on the you know halfway through the first song, <laughs> and just thinking to myself, "What are we doing? Sure, Why are we playing high school to twenty kids and blowing the power, like you know, yeah. like uh, what you know." I'm standing here doing this, and really in the back of my mind, I'm wondering about how I'm going to like get these two thousand more Locust Seven Inches pressed in time for their tour of whatever. You know what I mean? And like so. At that moment, I was preoccupied with that, with with the yeah. label, and you're not able that. to give a hundred percent everywhere. No, and and and, and the and the, the the returns on the VSS felt like they were diminishing. As as mm -hmm. short sighted as that now, I realize that was. But um, so yeah, I just uh, you know, the, 
tensions arose in the band. I, I personally didn't deal with stress very well, and I'm sure I contributed to everybody else's stress. And um, so it, yeah, it, it sort of imploded, um, which, you know, overnight allowed me the ability to focus on what I was doing, which yeah. was, um, you know, this, this uh, you know, commitment that I had to these other groups and um, a lot of a lot of other kind of more formalized sort of obligations and stuff that that you know and I really wanted GSL to be a force I wanted it to be something yeah. real that that could um, you know make it change music uh, you know uh, I, I can't even really remember what my ambitions were I just wanted to keep doing that I felt like it was the most important thing in the world yeah and um, and so losing the band allowed me to just go full steam ahead on that for a couple of years. But you know, having said that, I mean, everybody I knew was a musician. And uh, so, you know, within a few months I was down in um, the LA area. Uh, you know, Joey from Locust was a good friend of mine, still is a good friend of mine. And um, he and I started uh, messing around that about, fall very quickly into subpoena the past. Yep. And um, that group kind of morphed a couple times and went through different incarnations. Mm -hmm. um, by the time it was over, I was living in LA, um, doing the doing the kind of partnership thing with Erica Records that you mentioned. Yeah. Yep. And, um, basically was in LA for the next uh, about 10 years, um, mm -hmm. during which time the label kind of like crescendoed. Um, and ultimately sort of crashed but uh <laughs> um, there's a lot of yeah. great things too though you know i mean i feel like when you get like such force like it's it's only feels like a crash if it doesn't have like something that feels like it's dramatic like you know some big right. blowout yeah you're like, and it's what? also frankly it's more it's more it's more romantic to talk about things crashing than fizzling out yeah it just we just decided not to do it anymore <laughs> yeah but you were, I mean, really, you were oh i was gonna say like i mean i mean to some extent it was that but it was also it felt um like an it it felt abrupt you know but it was yeah. um, symptomatic of just the whole climate at that sure moment. but i mean like a lot of things came from that then you know i mean we were seeing the transitions of you know music into uh, you know we we saw early 90s when we were younger and into the mid 90s to like how things were changing musically and with friends around us but i don't think anything could be could prepare us for what would happen in like early aughts you know so like with things with like with that the driving getting big and then like you know eventually going into like mars volta and stuff um so i know you work with omar you know specifically too and like anything that they were doing when it comes to like doing like uh, focus on art for releases yeah. from him or people from Mars Volta. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe just dive into a little oh, bit of that. Um, that, that, that next, you know, that next step that you were doing, you know. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, if, I, I, if you would ask me in the 90s if there would be a mainstream resurgence of sort of like psychedelic rock in the, in the <laughs> 20s, after the in the first Suddenly, kids are into old Genesis. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> really, like, when, that's, but I guess that's Prague, but you know what I mean. But yeah, I mean that feeds into this too. I mean Prague definitely. You know, um, I just thought of Mars Volta, uh, psych, but very Prague at the same. Sure, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, two sides of the same coin, really, to me. And uh, you know, I was um, certainly pleasantly surprised when those guys started playing that music. I was really stunned when it became, um, I, there was no, there was no, absolutely no uh, surprise in the fact that the Mars Volta was big um, or that they signed to a major label immediately because that was sort of the, Easily, frankly, yeah, it was, it was a sure. foregone conclusion before the band even started. Big time, yeah. Um, but, uh, and I, and I, you know, I, I knew them there, I, I knew where their heads were at, I could see what they were, what was going on behind the scenes and they they had their other group de facto that was playing dub reggae music and um i expected a drastic change from at the drive-in but i didn't um anticipate what they wound up doing and i certainly would never have predicted that that would be embraced 
to no the kidding. On the scale that it was. You know, yeah. like the Red Hot Chili Peppers would be like, you're coming with us. You know what I mean? And like, <laughs> you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> now know, Nick, like, like Nick Cave makes fun of Chili Peppers, you know? Right, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, like everyone is that quote that he said. He's like, every time I hear something horrible on the radio, I ask what this is. Bad. And it's always yeah. Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, uh, that was a surreal moment. Absolutely. I mean, I remember yeah. going to London to see them play together at some... Uh, arena sports arena type of thing that was i think it's it has to be the biggest show i've ever been to of people that i'm friendly with you know what i mean and i just remember yeah 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 this is really like this is happening holy shit. yeah this is <laughs> so like how do we get here kind of thing you know yeah yeah but um yeah i mean that was a really exciting time it was an amazing incredible thing to be part of and like i consider myself so like just beyond lucky i mean i you know, I live in the South. I hear the word, I hear the expression, have a blessed day every single day. And it's meaningless to me. And um, most of these people's um, religious convictions, I feel, are not sincere. But uh, I, I will use that phrase in that regard because I do feel blessed in the sense that, um, you know, <clears throat> anybody could have had the opportunity to put out those records and, and sort of jump on that uh ride as it as it yeah. were and, and um for whatever reason i was in the right place at the right time and, and got lucky enough to be that person and it was like just an incredible thing it was a perfect uh, storm i mean back in um when my old band zarathustra was just starting in late 96 mm -hmm. early 97 um we played our first six to eight shows outside of city so we weren't ever home you know we were just kind oh, of wow. We were just, uh, we didn't, I don't know, there was just too much rock and roll going on in Sioux City. Like all the bands that were coming through were like, no offense to Blaze James, but flip side type bands. And right. so. Uh, was he Blaze from there? No, he's yeah. from LA, but he like, he always, um, when he would uh, message Pete, the guy I was talking about earlier for like shows, you know, it's just like, you know, he, here's this, you know, new band on the roster. Here I'm booking mm -hmm. this. But when he brought up, um, at the drive-in, mm. am I cutting out? No. Okay. No, it's, me. Maybe it's just it's just sorry. <laughs> Episode four. <laughs> but when he was um, uh, uh, he he messaged Peter in regards to like booking this new band called At the Drive-in, you know, or, mm. and was like, they don't sound like anything on flip side. They're not like a standard like rock and roll band by any means. But he's like, but they're workhorses and they're really good people. Mm -hmm. And so each time. Zarathustra was gone for the two or three times at the drive-in played within like this few months, you know, like, cause they were always on tour constantly and they got acquainted with everyone in Sioux city cause they were just good people. And they were just trying to be like, is there any band that we can play with that like could, could make sense with us? And so they always said like, Oh, our, you know, our friends in this band, but we were always out of town, but we would come back. And they would be in town for four or five days staying at our bassist's house who lived with this guy named Dave. Mm. So when Nervous Circuits came out and like the Locust 7 Inch came out, Omar and Cedric would be recording Jamie's records, you know, and like dubbing them. So like they just came out and they didn't really have time to like buy records or had, they always had like the cash to do it or want to carry around vinyl in a right. band for fucking months. Right. And that's how we got acquainted was, um, through stuff through like GSL and 3-1-G and our love for like yeah. just old yeah. early to mid 90s like kind of what I always call the just spastic hardcore this whole thing when they call like screamo god I fucking hated that <laughs> like, yeah. all of a sudden I just feel like it has been demoted several like fucking levels of just like yeah, yeah. whatever <laughs> yeah That's, you know how does it feel to be a proto screamo and you know enthusiast <laughs> yeah something? I don't know kind of weird I mean, yeah, any kind of label that's applied retroactively is, is odd. The history revisionists, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I love the enthusiasm. I love that, like, there's, like, kids who get into stuff that I'm doing, let alone, you know, what you were doing and people you've done stuff for. Sure. But yeah, it's, it's strange. Like, you don't, I don't know, the period of time is definitely, like, if you're witnessing it from, like, your standpoint or the band standpoint or, like, someone who was, like, purchasing your records it was a crazy period of time it was a wild west kind of a feel but yeah um 
so so yeah so and then um i guess when when did uh the whole thing with like gsl fold and you were ready to just shift gears completely was it during the mars volta era of like doing art and yeah um i wasn't really doing that much art yet i was uh the art thing okay. the art thing um the aesthetic side of the label was certainly always in my hands. It was something that I yeah. always uh, embraced uh, doing and loved and was probably in some ways one of my favorite things about it. Yeah. Um, designing advertisements and that kind of thing, occasionally doing a record cover here and there, but usually the the more kind of marketing end of things or the just the, the back end. Yeah. The thing that brings the aesthetic to it and everything, you know. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yes, um, yeah. I don't think at that time I understood that necessarily. In a, in a. Um, well, I guess I you know I did, but I also I I feel like my understanding of things like that has evolved now to a degree where I I, I feel like back then I was just shooting in the dark a lot, and uh, I don't you know. It's, it's hard to go back and relive the context. Yeah, you know I mean? I'm sure. A lot of those like kind of living in the moment, mixture of deadlines and just interests. Yeah, and, things and, such. Yeah, and grabbing whatever is like literally like oh, yeah. here. This will work. I'll just cut this up and well, yeah. you know. Totally. I, I, I've occasionally come across things that were used for one thing or another now, and I'm just like, what on earth was I thinking? Like using this picture or, or just what? Like how how did this seem? How did this seem suitable? You know. But I mean, whatever. Um, I. Uh, the yeah so the, the 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 visual side of things was was always kind of taking a, a little bit of a backseat um you know while the while the while the mars volta was on gsl uh year future was active so i was gone a yeah. lot doing stuff i had by that point the label was um had was had had existed long enough where there was a staff and a, and a structure in place um, I didn't have the distribution anymore, so that was a big weight off my shoulders. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, things just, you know, kind of snowballed mm -hmm. gradually over the years and, and got bigger and, and better in some ways and different in other ways. But um, the, 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 the joy and the excitement and the awesome thrill of the Mars Volta and their presence on the label. Mm -hmm was continually um, s sobered, if you, if you will, or, 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 or kept, uh, kept in checks and balances by the sheer um, financial difficulty of keeping up with the demand for their stuff and oh, wow. making yeah, it. That. Because we had kind of painted ourselves into a corner, into a corner with all the elaborate packaging and stuff on every subsequent record and triple LPs and picture discs, this and that. And, you know, that like, it was amazing to be able to do that stuff. Incredible to have an audience there ready to buy it, to know that you're going to like recoup your investment, what have you. But, um, you know, with a big enough catalog, keeping on top of that stuff, even with record, even with a record plant in your corner, yeah. it just gets hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, we also were very guilty. Myself, absolutely ninety percent of this, and Omar to a much lesser extent because he was not as hands-on with other groups as I was. But um, we put out way too many records, and um, it's easy to see that now. At the time, it wasn't so easy to see that. Um, we wanted to be there for everybody we wanted to be there for our friends we wanted to be a, a thing that was uh, had a thousand legs going in every direction and yeah. uh, thought we could we could accomplish that yeah. uh, um, and for a while we did but the real fact is that um a lot of the things that we were putting our money into were never going to uh pay for themselves or I think there was definitely like a handful of releases or groups or whatever it was that was taking care of what was yeah. happening more or less. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, th 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 we put out a lot of groups that, you know, for every group that we put out that really kicked ass and toured and lived up to the sort of their end of the bargain, so to speak, we put out probably three or four who didn't do those things. Sure. And they were our friends and we loved them and we loved the records or what have you. Um, yeah. Yeah. But 
by the same token, like uh, that, that, that doesn't, that's an unsustainable model, you know, and, and touring really, as you know, is, is the way you expose a band and the way you sell records. And um, yeah, the, uh, you know, um, what can I say? Hindsight is twenty twenty. I definitely would do things differently now, but sure. well, yeah, of course. By the same token, like we still stand behind all the stuff that we put out and 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 love them all as as our as our own um, descendants, you know, to some yeah. to some extent. Well, that's I definitely could say that about GSLs. Like when I remember I'd see releases, it was like there isn't you know it wasn't like like earlier labels that we'd spoke about like say like with gravity where even though that they all had different sounding bands but there was definitely like you could tell in certain eras a certain like kind of scenes or movements yeah. were going on yeah and with gsl it was like you can tell flat out like i like starlight desperation i like locust you know i like i like these they're friends i like these groups and i stand behind them you know you yeah. just felt the need to like they people should hear them you know and right. And I know that's like, that was kind of like with different, but uh, similar in some degree. It was with, when we were working with uh, Simonetti with Trouble Man, I was like, once he had a budget where he was able to put out a lot of things a month, you know, mm -hmm. like he would always be told like, you know, you should just really focus on two albums and two mm -hmm. touring bands. And he's like, mm -hmm. nah, I want to put out fucking 12 releases a month, <laughs> you know? He's like, yeah. after that, it's up to them. They yeah. should tour. You know, yeah. I, it's not my job to be on them to tour, but I feel that they deserve to have something that's tangible that you can buy, you know. I can relate to that, definitely. Yeah. And you also, you know, there's definitely, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of gross, and to a lot of people it probably sounds like the antithesis of, of, of punk and, and um, anti-commercialism and that kind of thing, but there is a tendency towards over... Um, over releasing things once you are in a situation where cash flow is a major issue and you yeah, have it means uh, helping out more doing yeah more. and if you're distributed by a big distributor with a huge network of stores especially chain stores um satisfying that system uh is sometimes um you know like keeping it keeping things going where they're supposed to be going um keeping a continual uh, uh, flow of in and out with these people is, mm. is essential. And so you find yourself, and I've noticed it with, um, back when GSL was at, at Mordam, um, I know, I, well, yeah, we, I about at that, that point we were ever. part of the, we were part of what I'm talking about. But before we went there, I saw it happening where these labels like, you know, alternative tentacles and groups and, and, and labels like that, that had, you know, <clears throat> been around for decades and had massive catalogs of stuff were still in this routine where they're putting out three or four albums a month by groups you never heard every month yeah. all year long year after year yeah. and you start to realize that um there's definitely some compromising going on in terms of the quality of what's coming out because Certainly. you realize you're feeding this machine you know yeah, yeah. um and it's like it's not entirely uh you know it's hard to it's hard it's hard to resist that it's hard to, to it's hard to do it successfully without falling into that trap some people do and they're very clever with it um but i i felt in our case it was getting more and more difficult mm. and we were also having to you know um as we were watching physical sales literally be replaced by digital mm -hmm. um that was a big change to reckon with and um, also feeling like um, to be successful and to, and to keep going and to, to, be, to maintain a presence and all these things, it was, it was actually necessary to not just be a record label, but to kind of be a marketing company too. Yeah. And, you know, now <clears throat> this far along social media and having worked at Sargent House and having seen how all these other labels, you know, I can understand much clearer now how we could have adapted at the time. And, and where our shortcomings were and that kind of thing. But oh. at the time, the idea of becoming a marketing company was mm -hmm. very unappealing. Yeah, especially like you're saying, like, I mean, you're in, you know, like, especially with like you're in VSS, 
yeah. uh, you had a distribution, you had a label, you had releases coming out. And I mean, you, you, a band ended cause you know, you're like, I, I heads over everywhere else. I need to take care of all these other things. So like, yeah. I'm just trying to imagine then something like that on top of it. Like, now you yeah. need me to do this. Like <laughs> that's another yeah. full-time job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was, I was, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I was, I was tired from the whole thing. I was a little bit, um, you know, GSL had been going for 14 years by that point. Um, again, like if I had it to do to, to do over now, I don't know, don't know if I would have necessarily thrown in the towel again. Um, because I understand now what GSL's value was and, um, not only to me as a person, but in the world. And, um, you know, uh, it's just one of those things. I I don't really have any regrets about it because I'm happy with the way things have gone since then. Sure. Um, but I do feel like um, I'm I'm disappointed. The label ended a little anticlimactically. Let me put it that way. Okay. I wish I wish we had um, found a way to prolong or prolong it, and uh, I don't know. Just do just just take it in. A, just let it, I just, uh, I wish it had ended in a different fashion. That's sure. All. That's, yeah. That's, that's my only regret, really. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, since then you've, you've put out this book and, uh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you want to, before we wrap up, you want to talk about like how that came about and. Sure. Yeah. So, um, actually brings our whole discussion <laughs> full circle kind of because, um, yeah. the book was published by, um, an imprint called Robot Enemy Books, which uh, belongs to my friend Bob, who was my college roommate and bandmate back in Savalas. So, uh, that's right, the guy who moved away, right? Exactly, and he continues yeah. to move away. Right now, he's living in Abu Dhabi, in, uh, Dubai. No, Abu Dhabi, sorry, he lives in Abu Dhabi. He's lived all over the world and um, has lived a very fascinating life. And um, I'm very fortunate to still call him a good friend of mine. I have this great uh, opportunity to see him once every couple of years. And uh, yeah, he published Headspaces for me um, about three years ago, right before I moved here, as a matter of fact. And um, it really just is a sort of um, collects all of the, really everything I've done since GSL ended. Okay. Um, yeah. Once the label stopped, uh, yeah, I really at that point switched gears and the, and the art took the front seat, so to speak. and. Um, with Omar's encouragement and, and his relentless <laughs> schedule of solo releases, I was able to kind of, uh, you know, really experiment and, and um, get a lot of work in print and uh, develop what I was doing and explore myself as a, as a visual artist. And uh, that's something that's definitely still going on. Um, but the, uh, the book just seemed to kind of book a de uh, bookend a decade of, of work that kind of felt in some sense uh, like a concise body of stuff. It sort of fit in this, this uh, relatively neat uh, area between two major parts of my life, which were the record label and now being here in Hot Springs uh, yeah. involved with Loki Arts. The, the stuff in Headspace is really sort of is this... Uh, kind of like interim period uh where i kind of developed my visual language i guess if if you want to call it that i'm not sure if i yeah i really would but, <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Uh, yeah and then actually bob and i just uh we we just co-released another book about four months ago five months ago to do with colorado in the 90s oh my god oh cool is there a time frame for that or uh... yes it's uh that's covers so so bob did a book himself called the den void which covers the years uh 82 to 86 uh and <clears throat> we our collaborative um, project is a sequel to that it's called colorado crew den void 2 and it covers um 80 uh did I say 82 to 86? I meant 82 to 88. And our new book covers uh, 88 to 96. Nice. I look so forward to that. Basically, awesome. by, that, yeah, by that point, he and I had both, were both gone from Colorado. Sure. So it kind of like, you know, um, 
everything that we know about firsthand up until a certain point and then we're we're done cool but, uh, well, yeah yeah i mean uh so i guess before we wrap up um i mean you know we know there's a lot of uncertainty with this year into the next year of, of a lot of things but clearly you can still you know still be creative and you know be able to publish things or whatever sure. do you have anything beyond this book that you're part of that you're really excited about or any game plans that haven't been completely thrown well up? I mean, <laughs> in the back of my mind there you know and i certainly uh, have an ongoing discussion with a couple people from um a, certain, a couple bands in particular but the idea of a gsl book eventually is something that excites me and um, that'd be cool that'd be really cool to, I'd love to try and stick my teeth into sooner or later. Um, it should include a release. <laughs> what? I said it should include a release. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, there's a couple of things that we, that we did. There's a couple of compilations that we did that only ever came out digitally that I would love to do, you know, vinyl versions of. That'd be cool. Like some weird, like kind of like limited run, something kind yeah. of. So, yeah. Yeah. There's one thing in particular that I, I think is actually one of the best things we ever put out and it's, certainly one of the most overlooked and um, easily one of the worst sellers. And that was a compilation right, you know, a, about a year and a half, two years before the label went under called um, Golden Grouper, which was not the most um, well-advised name for a compilation. I think that, first of all, was just kind of like, what does that even mean? Um, the artwork is not particularly good and there's not very, there's not really any known bands on it. But having said that, um, I remember now the whole point of doing it in the first place was was to really, um, we were getting a massive amount of demo tapes at the end. And um, a lot of the stuff was really good. And a lot of it was just groups, like I said, we were already putting out too much stuff. We just couldn't handle it all. Yeah. But I thought one useful thing we could do would be to put out a compilation of some of the best of that stuff. Okay. And, um, I recently listened to that record and was really, um, surprised by the variety of the stuff on it. I mean, man, most of it, I felt like I'd never even heard it before, which was <laughs> totally yeah. ridiculous. But yeah. um, anyway, that record I think has actually aged really well and it's totally like not on the radar. And, um, you know, it's compilation be difficult to do because of the paperwork involved with getting everybody to sign off, but mm. maybe, maybe one day, but um, yeah. Uh, beyond that, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm definitely, all my focus these days is on what's going on here in Hot Springs with Loki Arts. The coronavirus has created a really um, unprecedented situation for us as, as it has for everybody else, but we are, uh, you know, being forced to reinvent what we do here and how we do it. And, um, Thankfully, I have a huge support network here and a lot of um, awesome people involved, and um, we are doing exactly that. So this summer, um, we were, it's just uh, <clears throat> a real hands-on um, kind of uh, reinvention of our um, classes and other things that we offer here every summer traditionally on, in a brick-and-mortar building. We're now doing online, and so there's a there's a, a kind of a momentum that we're trying to capture with all this and really elevate this organization to what we see as a sort of the next level. Sure. So really that's, that's what I anticipate the rest of this, the, this calendar year being for me. Um, I am in a band here. We, uh, with Bobby, um, who I mentioned earlier, and, uh, that's called mind writer. We started making a record, whether we actually will ever finish it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, it's hard to say. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm never someone who's had much of a plan in place in life. Um, and I feel like I have even less of one now because of, uh, the way the world is, but, uh, you know, I think there's always, uh, at the very least that there's like the, the, the one constant is, is I can always turn to yourself and be creative and, and explore what's going on in your mind. And for me, I, I love that opportunity and, you know, um this lockdown has provided a lot of that so i in, in some respects i'm very grateful for the time you know? sure well cool well i mean i really appreciate you wanting to take time to do this and uh oh, man, my pleasure. Put up any any links 
to anything, especially to the book, to anything else you wish in the cool. description. So, um, cool. yeah, man, it's been, fuck, it's been a couple decades, but it's- Yeah, it's been a little too long. If you ever look <laughs> down to uh, Arkansas, you gotta give me a shout out. Yeah, we'll definitely want to stay in touch with you. And um, yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you. My pleasure, man, anytime. Let's do it again sometime. Sounds good, man. Take care. Peace,